So again, thanks, Jonathan. And our next speaker is uh, Dan Pitt. So uh, Dan is going to talk about Open Networking Foundation. Uh, this is the uh, organization that is chartered with uh, standardization of OpenFlow and promotion of OpenFlow and SDN. Uh, Dan serves as the uh, executive director of o ONF. Uh, and Dan has been my partner in uh, doing this Open Networking Summit. I got to know him well in the last three, four months. So uh, my conclusion is that Dan has been a perfect choice for being the executive director of Open Networking Foundation. Look at his background. He has been in networking for almost ever. Uh, he has seen, uh, and then he took a sabbatical for 10 years when networking was not as interesting. He took 10 years sabbatical and now has come back to networking because of open for and SDN, that is what he says. He has worked at companies like IBM, HP, Bay, and Nortel. So you can see that he has enough experience of how large companies work. Okay. Uh, he has worked at a number of startup companies as well, but I decided not to list them. Then he has worked with a number of protocol stack. Actually, I should have listed SNA as well. I'm sure Dan has worked with SNA, right? So he has worked with all these protocol stacks that we have invented over the years. And not only that, he has worked with all these standards organizations like IETF, IEEE, DAVIC, ATM Forum. I'm sure I'm forgetting a few more. So that is Dan's experience. So in order to come and kind of help with the Open Networking Foundation, he has kind of the perfect experience, expertise, connection, and some gray hair, if you look closely enough. Okay? <laughs> but I think in case of Dan, the ratio of wisdom to gray hair is one of the highest. Okay, so with that, here is Dan. You know, if you make the denominator small enough, the quotient should be very high. <laughs> Thank you, Guru. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and you know, uh, Martin Casado uh, yesterday morning remarked on the community we have around this movement and how diverse it is. And I've been very impressed uh, with the people I've spoken to personally and that have shown demos that have spoken at this conference with how truly diverse it is, uh, horizontally and vertically, the roles that you play and the industries um, that you are part of. Uh, that makes me really more optimistic than anything else that. This is something that's actually taking hold. And I mean, I have a lot of scientific interest in it, of course, as a computer scientist, but I have a greater interest in seeing it have some commercial impact. In the um, startup work I've done, it's mostly translating university or institutional research into startup companies. And it's a, it's a real challenge to, um, to make that, to make that uh, transition. Um, and to take something that might be cool technically and find that people actually want to pay for it. I, uh, I spent quite uh, an enjoyable period at the Plug and Play Tech Center in Sunnyvale. It's a terrific startup incubator. It's not your typical incubator. Uh, the business model is not based on their going public or getting bought, it's based on rent. So it's very sustainable. Um, but I give a, a presentation sometimes, we have a thing called Plug and Play University. And I give a presentation titled, So What? And it's all about, so you have this idea, and that's great, and it's cool, and it works, but who cares? You know, if it's not going to be something people care about enough to deploy and implement, then I don't care how cool it is technically. So what excites me about this is that enough people seem to care that it means something to them. And it was really the prospect of that sort of impact that brought me back into networking um, from my sort of sabbatical doing startups, and that was an engineering and had a lot of aspects of engineering to get excited about. But this was worthwhile. So um, I am with the Open Networking Foundation, and this presentation is to tell you something about the Open Networking Foundation, why we exist, and, and what we do. And um, I love playing with words. Um, I just It's something I grew up with. And so I just came up with this the other day. We are the standard bearer for SDN. And that is the standard of the flag that we carry around. And uh, we also do some standards, but I will put that in perspective for you. So these are things I will cover, but this is not an outline because this is not the order in which I'm going to cover things. Um, but I want you to understand why this was created, what's different about it from any other organization, um, and, and possibly motivate you to figure out how you might contribute to it because we are a contributor-led organization from uh, various sorts of players. So, 
basically what we are is a foundation for the advancement of software defined networking. And oh, by the way, we do create some standards. We are not what I would consider a traditional SDO, Standards Development Organization. There are plenty of those. Our mission is a little bit different from theirs. Our vision is not to create standards. Our vision is to make SDN what I call the new norm for networks and level iteration. I want to look back five years from now and have everybody around me saying, can you believe we actually used to do it that way? I mean, right now if you look at a switch, what does it cost to put an open flow client in the switch? Well, somebody told me not too long ago that the cost of putting an open flow client into a switch or putting open flow into a switch is, is really fairly small. But the cost of not putting it in can be gigantic. I want this to be, oh, of course we do it this way. And haven't we always done it this way? Um, so our mission, if I wanted to anywhere define the success of ONF, how do I just tell whether I'm successful in my job, whether we're successful as an organization, is to see a vibrant market in product services, customers, applications, and users. If that happens, I will feel we have done our job. So we have some tangible and concrete goals. Uh, we're creating standards to help this along. We want to create them rapidly in a different way. That's why we were created um, for the switching-based ecosystem. But we also want to accelerate the understanding of how to realize the abstractions behind the concept of open flow, and that we've heard a lot about in the last two days. I don't know when the last time was that I spent two days at a conference and heard the word abstraction more times than I have in the last two days. It's probably been 20 years since I heard it mentioned that much. Just from a legal standpoint, we are a nonprofit industry consortium. We're known as a 501c6. You've probably heard of 501c3. Uh, C3s are charitable organizations. I regret to say that we are not one of those. Do um, you know how many 501Cs there are? There are 28. So we're number six. Uh, we are funded by member dues. Uh, and that's our only source of revenue at this point. Um, membership is open to any organization that wants to pay $30,000 a year due to the bylaws and the IPR policy. Um, on the matter of dues, the dues fund our operation. Um, but uh, they're, they're fairly high as these things uh, go, and there's sort of some logic to that, um, which is that as an organization to, first of all, get some standards out and make things happen, we are looking for only the seriously committed participants. And so this is a fairly high entry level. A lot of people would love to come and go to discussions and talk and travel. We don't have a lot of travel. Um, but we really want people with skin in the game, and it costs, costs a fair amount of money. But you'll see that it actually can be money well spent because our IPR policy is terrific. It's royalty free for everything having to do with open flow. So we, uh, if you want to use protocol, any IP in the protocol, the trademark, you want to trade on it, sell some gets branded open flow, we have all that stuff, you get that. It's not like reasonable and non-discriminatory, but one person's definition of reasonable might not be the same as another person's definition of reasonable. I've had those arguments in the IEEE. No argument here. It's free. It's included. $30,000. Compare that to the cost of hiring a law firm for a week and a half. It's easier this way. Uh, now, ONF itself owns no intellectual property. It's all in the hands of our members. And uh, so it's not us that we get sued. We're here to protect the interests of our members. And, you know, we are the Open Networking Foundation. Um, the hyphen is actually between the open and the networking, not between the networking and foundation. Um, we're advocates of open networking. Uh, our deliberations are pretty much closed to non-members for reasons of protection of their IP. Now, we declare that we are about open interfaces and not open source. Um, and we don't do reference implementations, but we really encourage them by the community for anybody that wants to do that. It's just not part of our charter um, to do. And frankly, we wouldn't be very good at that because we are me. I'm the only employee. And, uh, <laughs> I'm busy. So 
when you create a new organization, you have an opportunity to create a culture of employees, members, and a community. And we are trying to innovate not only in technology and an approach to networking, we're trying to innovate in how you run an organization like this and in how you create standards. You saw I've been to a few standards meetings myself. I've learned a lot. Uh, there's a lot that I, uh, I admire and I take with me, and there are a few things that I really don't want to ever repeat again in my life. This gives us, gives us a chance to do things in a better way. Uh, as much as possible, I'd like not to have too many politics uh, getting in the way, because we, we do want to run quickly, um, and we want to really be an agile organization. I want to be a learning organization. I consider ONF to be a startup company. And we're good at that in Silicon Valley, which means we try stuff, we iterate with customers. You've probably seen Steve Blank's presentation about that. Startup company is an organization in search of a business model. So our members are our customers. Uh, we're learning what serves their needs best. Uh, we're not afraid to try things, and if they don't work, we'll fix them. We are not putting processes in place of need. So we sort of lag the need, and I get complaints from members, we don't have a process for this, and we don't have a process for that, and it's true, but now we know what they should be, we'll put some in place. As for driving standards, um, we are unusual that we are a user-led organization. I'll show that on, on the organization uh, sort of description in a moment. Uh, but we are um, trying to create standards that actually meet user needs. I've been in a lot of standards committees where um, it was a battleground between vendors, and the users did not really have a voice. And sometimes I would try to bring in the user's voice, and no one would believe me because I was with a vendor. And, they're probably wise not to. We all think we speak for our users. I'd rather have the users speaking for themselves. Uh, partly because of the cost of entry, but partly in the way we interact with our members, we are looking for the contributors among our member companies to be those that do understand the implementation uh, impacts of what they propose and what we standardize. You know, I love the beauty of network architecture. Um, when I got married, um, uh, I married a musician, and so she makes beautiful music. And uh, I still have a, a, a cassette tape of our wedding, which we try to listen to on our anniversary of the year. And uh, our rabbi was a very good friend, and he was talking about beauty a lot in this, and how we're both attracted to beauty, but he did not understand what beauty I saw in computer architecture. And I felt sorry for him, because there is great beauty in these things, and in network architecture. But we're not a slave to it, and I in particular am not, am not a slave to it. Um, and that's why the reality of implementation really has to guide what we do and what we don't do. Now, the third bullet there is my favorite one, what differentiates us from a lot of others. We're going to standardize as little as necessary. Now, that means we have sort of a minimalist approach to what we standardize. What does that leave the vendors to do? Well, there will be vendor differentiation, and we're talking a lot about vendor extensions, but we don't want that to lead to lock-in, nor do we want to fragment the market. We want to create a market. So we're trying to, we're trying to balance these things in really the most effective way. Another aspect of standardizing as little as possible is what Scott said, and Jennifer reiterated yesterday, we are becoming more and more like a software community. And a lot of software standards do not emerge from standards committees before the fact. Either they emerge from the industry and stand alone, or they then go and become uh, de jure standards after they are de facto standards. And uh, that's something we look at very closely. And for parts of this whole scene that are very much software dependent, that's probably we'll let the industry experiment and see what comes up. We don't put people's names on drafts. I had people working for me in uh, some of my previous positions who told me that their career objective is to have their name on an RFC. It's <laughs> very nice, and that'll help your job mobility, but it won't help you do well inside our company. Um, so that's a culture that, uh, cultural behavior that we are discouraging uh, by not having that association. Now, because um, this is a nascent movement, and we're still trying to understand what it can do, we're trying to get implementations out there very quickly. 
So they have to be relevant, they have to be implementable. And this is where the balance between gorgeous architecture and the reality of implementation comes into play. Now, when I say protocol agnostic, in the ideal world, and in the world of the network processing companies, even today, you can see them outside in the demos, um, I shouldn't care what these fields in a header actually mean. Is this uh, a MAC source address? Is it a VLAN header? Is it an MPLS tag? Is it an IP something? I don't know. It's a byte offset, a certain number of bits. If it matches a pattern, I take this action. I wish it were that way. You know, back in my mind, the research motivation for experimenting with non-IP protocols says that we shouldn't be a slave to the IP and MAC you know, fields and headers. Well, we can't get there today because we need merchant silicon to create a mass market and to be easily adoptable by many, many people. And so there's another balance we have to strike. I want to accommodate what can be done. I want to move them in that direction. And that's a tension that we manage. And by doing this, you know, quickly and getting, making it possible to do some experimentation, we'll get some feedback on what the customers and the users really do need. So we're covered by a board of directors. I'll show you who they are in a moment. Uh, there are no vendors on the board. This is a bit unusual, um, but it's by design. Uh, frankly, you know, if I were a vendor, I would be delighted to go somewhere where the users are telling me, if you build this, we will buy it. Uh, rather than my saying, I'm going to build this, and you better buy it, and having to say, gee, I'm not sure that's what I want. Uh, we have an executive director reports to the board. Uh, right now, it's our only employee. Um, and it's perhaps the only person in the, art, in the whole organization that has to be vendor neutral. You can't own stock in any other company. And I thought, gee, I should think, what about $1,000 to each of the members? Um, can't do it. I'm sorry. So I don't have any equity. Um, and I actually have an interest in seeing all of our members succeed, both the users and the vendors. And the feeling I've gotten from this movement is that we're all creating a really big pie. We'll all have a share in the pie that's making a great taste of the pie. We have a technical advisory group that reports to the board, um, advises the board on things that are kind of fundamental that cross over different uh, technical areas. Um, this is the, uh, the guru committee. And it's made up of people from vendors and from vendors, um, you know, members only. Um, but these are the, uh, uh, the wise people of ONF. Uh, they don't make decisions. They don't tell any working group what to do. They will advise report to the board. So we have working groups. This is nothing novel. But what's a little different about our working groups is that they can only be created if the board says so. You have to make a case to the board what you're going to do and when. Um, and they are only chaired by people appointed by the board. They don't elect their own chair. And that, that simplifies things a lot. Now, how do we select them? Um, it's really based on the initiative that they show and the suitability they have for the task. It's work. And you have to be willing to do the work to get into, into a position of responsibility. And we do charge the chairs with a lot of responsibility. They're the ones who have to determine whether their group is ready to progress something. It's met the sufficient level of consensus, and they have to make sure it sells to the board. Uh, so we give them uh, a lot of responsibility and a lot of autonomy in running their working groups. Um, the board has chartered some working groups. I'll tell you what they are. They're really only chartered uh, for a fairly short term, then they have to reapply. So here's what we did. We said we were going to do it. We did this. Now, either we're done, or we would like to go on and do the following. They're meeting really on their own timetable. We don't have regular meetings. Our second member workday is tomorrow. We have one in June. Uh, we've only been around since March, publicly launched March 22nd. So we're six months old on Saturday. Um, and we don't have regular meetings. We might have regular meetings, but we, we really want to run at their own speed. We want not to disadvantage people in other locations and geographies. They have mailing lists, they have conference calls, it turns out that does disadvantage people from other languages, cultures, and time zones. So we'll have to balance that. Um, but we're deliberately not trying to make this an organization that people want to join so they can go on you know, lovely so-called working vacations in exotic, beautiful locations. The chairs are uh, de facto members of the Council of Chairs, and we meet you know, weekly in the conference calls. 
um, to assure consistency across the working group, figure out who does what, share best practices, uh, and then decide something is ready to go to the board for approval. Uh, the executive director is the chair of the council of chairs. So we look kind of like this um, at present, and it's a pretty boring picture, but this is how it works. <clears throat> These are the companies that are on the board. There are six companies, uh, so-called promoters, they pay a little more, and then we have the founding directors, uh, Nick McEwen and Scott Schenker, who are also on the board. And we have some of these people here in the room today, and I'm, I'm really thrilled by that. They've been a terrifically supportive board coming from data center, network operators, um, with experience and real motivation of why they're doing this. So they've been very helpful to me personally, and I think terrific guidance for the organization. And as of today, these are the other members. So we are a total of 47 member companies. Um, a lot of people are here, of course. A minute to look at that. Uh, there are other users, not just vendors, here. Um, I would certainly put out Comcast, NTT, and Tencent among them. So we have software, we have hardware, we have chips, we have training, we have a little bit of sort of applied research. Uh, it's a terrific group of companies. Now, this list is perhaps more notable not by the names that are there than by the names that are not there. And I don't really want to name any of them. They all seem to come from one particular letter of the alphabet. But I will mention one that is not here, and that is Apple. And I think it's probably a good idea, because the last thing that I want to see is for SDN to become ISDN. <laughs> <laughs> OpenFlow started at Stanford, and there was this ad hoc group that met on Tuesday afternoons every week, um, and they hammered out release 0 0.8 and 0 0.8.9 and 0 0.9 and 1.0 and 1.1 before we took it over. And uh, so most of the implementations you'll see are 1.0. There are some of 1.1. Um, and if you were an interrupt, that was almost all, I think, all 1.0 implementations, partly coming from the reference implementation of Open vSwitch. Um, and so this does all of the normal things of transferring load tables from a controller to a switch. And it's got field definitions for what you do with the map fields and IPv4 and that sort of a single table. Um, and it was very basic, very useful. And then it led to 1.1, which added somewhat more complexity, special sequence of tables, and a lot of counters for measuring when things happen. Um, hasn't been as widely implemented because it's harder for the merchant silicon vendors to handle some of these tables. Um, and so what we're doing now is uh, you're continuing to evolve this in ways that I think are going to be helpful to the market. We've defined these, and we've chosen to continue calling them 1.x rather than 2.0, because we're not ready for a wholesale change. We want to get more field experience with this. So we're going to put in important missing pieces like IPv6. And this will be coming out December 8th. We have a board meeting, expect the board to approve what's in 1.2. We'll have some configuration things in there and a lot of extensibility. We don't really have modularity of the spec yet, which we will need to uh, kind of make this a more sensible family. Hopefully that'll come along early next year and you can see some of the things here. Um, and we are certainly interested in what it means to be conformant uh, as well as being flexible <coughs> with OpenFlow. Now, as I said before, I want to see experience by customers and users. And so we're seeking widespread uh, adoption of 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4 to get this sort of feedback. So I'm talking to our board members, I'm talking to our other members, saying, what are your plans for implementing and deploying this? What might be standing in the way? What should we be doing differently to help that along? Uh, we certainly want to uh, take advantage of what the current merchant silicon can do, because it can give us tremendous amounts of experience, even if it's not the ideal yet. Um, but I also want to motivate the merchant silicon vendors to see that mountaintop, that's where we're going. Let's figure out a way to get there. We might have to tack left or tack right, but that's where we're going to go. We have chartered three working groups so far. They are these. Uh, everything was done in the Tuesday afternoon meetings, and so it's kind of a mishmash, and that turned into the extensibility working group, 
which kind of has everything. Um, but that'll change a little bit over time. So they put an extensible match, uh, extensible error messages. You know, we have a wire protocol. They're in charge of the forwarding model, and also all the MAC specifics and the IPv4 specifics. And the IPv6 sort of the factor because it came in with our extensible match. Um, and they are working very hard, and there are a lot of people on that. And it's terrific, led by Jean Tourille, who was here yesterday. I'm not sure if he's here today. Uh, absolutely terrific uh, contributor. Configuration management. Uh, configuration and management is what it really is. And Deepak Banzal, you know, he's been here this week. And they're doing configuration protocol uh, and also a schema for some basic configuration functions under guidance from the board and the tag for the, the next release and, and then continue to flesh that out in future releases. Uh, we've had discussions about multiple controllers. Right now it's just a single controller with a, a single known uh, backup. We'll work on that a little bit more. And then testing and interoperability under Michael Howe from Ixia, who's also here. Uh, they're off to a really good start looking at uh, conformance, performance, and interoperability. The question came up yesterday, what does it mean to be conformant with OpenFlow? Well, we want to figure that out because we know our members want to say that they are, and uh, the users want to know that what they're buying certainly is. I also understand that there's a difference between conformance to a standard and interoperability with others that conform, and so we are tackling those uh, uh, with that understanding. We have some other discussion groups with a mailing list that are not chartered working groups, but they're topics that our members wanted to work on. So we have something called Match Action Table. This was intended really to be the home of the protocol specific parts, so that extensibility could be uh, the foundational parts. We're not quite there yet because things kind of came in one package, but that's okay. So uh, we will probably turn it into kind of a, a documentation separation. Uh, it's not a lot we have to do about IPv4 and IPv6 at this point. We have a discussion starting in the hybrid forwarding plane. So we talked less yesterday a little bit about hybrid switches and had some questions about it. Um, the hybrid switch and the hybrid network. They're both open flow components and legacy components. Um, how do you share the resources and uh, what do you do about shipping lanes? Do you have these ships passing in the night or do you actually share some of them and how do you manage that? And then finally, we have this thing called the Northbound API, uh, which is part of the, the suite of SDN abstractions. Uh, I'll show you the diagram of that in a second. People wanted to talk about it. There was a little rush to try to standardize uh, that, and we sort of held off on that. The ITF is kind of interested in that. Um, but this is where we want to talk about object models and service models, uh, uh, virtualization. Uh, how do you actually characterize the network toward those user applications that would take advantage of the network, and how do these components interact? Not that these are things we will necessarily standardize, but we want to understand them and talk about them. You know, whether profiles come into play here or not remains to be seen. Now, let me say more about the second bullet here. You've seen this. You know, we took everything out of each box. We moved it up to a network wide OS, and we have the open flow protocol. Uh, where the operating system network controller talks to the forwarding plane and switches. And then we have some network OSs. Right now there are a number of them out there, um, and we're learning a lot about that. And then we have this well-defined global view. I didn't say a standard API because they all have different ones right now. And uh, so that's kind of how we are. Well, that's a very simplistic view of this world. It's actually a pretty rich environment above the OpenFlow protocol itself. So, a little protocol there that does that. And you know, we've got our arms around it. We know what it means uh, to standardize that pretty well. But we've got the operating system. We've got some control programs embedded in it. You know, if you look at the controllers now you can buy. They do really cool things, part of it. But other things might live above it. We've heard a number of good examples of those yesterday. Um, it's even more interesting than that put it some virtualization. And uh, all right, well, that's sort of a different tool. How do I do that? And how do I translate uh, the global network view to a 
an abstract network view, and maybe there are control programs that really belong there, and then, well, then we have the flow visor below. This is a really useful tool. Are we going to standardize a flow visor? I don't think we're going to standardize it, but how do we understand how this works? And then, gosh, there are more apps and more tools. It's hard to say whether they're uh, user apps or network apps or management apps or control apps. Uh, they're going to be there. How do these components play together? What can we do to help foster this ecosystem? If these things are in software, it's not clear that we're going to say, hey, here's the standard for this. But if we can talk about what are the models that would drive their development and make them work together more easily, let's talk about that. Now, right now we're focused on open flow. That's our first order of business, but this is actually uh, front and center for kind of what's next. And then we're also going to be doing more about educating the market. We've heard the last two days a lot of terms used by different people not necessarily meaning the same thing. I'm sure if I asked you to write down what does network virtualization mean, I'd get some really interesting different answers. So I'm not going to do that. There will be no quizzes. But I think if we can help create some market demand, you know, let's position this as, as the future in a way that makes uh, sense to customers and brings value to them. Let's educate both our members. I don't know how many of you have had trouble in your companies getting other people in your company to understand what you're doing here. Um, I've heard from a few people that that's the case. I think we can help with that jointly and together. Um, as well as to the non-members who are trying to understand what is this movement all about and why do I have so many people telling me that they're interested in it. So this is part of our, our vision of creating this market. And it's another part of our desire to help our members succeed. We want them to succeed in selling their products and services. So how can we do this? Just some ideas. Common vocabulary, common messaging, we can develop collateral toolkits, or a lot of things we can do. And we can collaborate on who appears where and says what I had a meeting with somebody yesterday here about, gee, I can't go to this and speak about ONAP and the principles of software defined networking, so I'll work with somebody who can go. So be not part of ONAP. This is just getting started. Uh, I'll be meeting with some members tomorrow on work day to talk about it. And if you're interested in this, talk to me. I'd love to hear from you. So my conclusions are these. There are three parts here. ONF is the home for open flow. All the rights are transferred from Stanford to the Open Networking Foundation. And we want to take it from where it came out of Stanford to something that the commercial market can really deploy um, and get some business value from. So that's, that's really where 90% of our effort is going. So we'll have a family of standards, just the right number hopefully. We've got the foundation. We'll have some building blocks. We'll offer some choices. So, and we're doing protocols for OpenFlow itself and configuration and management, and I said compliance and operability and some performance benchmarking. Uh, here's some tools you have to build around this. I think most of these will be sort of in the management domain. Uh, we're really striving for development by, by vendors, deployment by users, so we get experience, we get feedback, and we can iterate. There's a lot more to SDN than just OpenFlow, and that's the big picture that we're really excited about because that will make this turn into something very real and very valuable. You can't necessarily understand the value of OpenFlow by talking about a protocol. The value is in what it enables. The protocol is terrific and essential, but it's really not very interesting. It's just the protocol to convey these things. What's interesting is what you can do when it's in place, and those are these sort of upper parts of the picture of software defined networking. <laughs> And this is where we cultivate this ecosystem of new capabilities, new features, new players, and new types of businesses. I'm particularly excited by the prospect of venture investment in networking companies again. You know, Ten years ago when I kind of went away for a while, it was really hard to get any kind of networking company funded. You know, it was hardware-based, it's expensive, you couldn't get your multiples. But if it turns into special feature for this kind of capability with a web 2.0 like startup based on software only. It'll be easy to see those multiples. We'll get investors and we'll hopefully have a flowering of entrepreneurship and innovation again. And the combination of technical standards and market education will, I think, drive the ecosystem and create market pull for our members and really make it happen and make it real. I'm happy to take questions. Dan, you gave 
is such a nice comprehensive presentation that everyone knows what ONF is, what open flow is all about now. Any questions? Yeah, well, so I've, I've um, one of my research topics has been looking at standardized bodies, and obviously you've done a lot of work to looking into how to evolve, you know, what what um, not not of the standards bodies, but the creation of standards and the community around that. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how how did you formulate? You know, what were some of the thoughts behind the organizational structure that you uh, put in place behind ONF? Well, what, what aspects of the structure are there? So, um, you know, there's you know, clearly many things that you um, you put into place, such as not having vendors be part of the board of directors and, and those things. Were there a lot of, uh, you know, was that mostly based on the experience of the, of the team members? Did you guys do any research into, uh, specific research into the previous? I think it was based almost entirely on, on experiences that people had. Um, we could have just said, that let's do this in some other existing committee, not even created this. but. Two reasons why we didn't do that. Uh, one is uh, we want a more effective way to make standards that serve the needs, of, the needs of users. And the second is that there's more to this than just the technical standards. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Dan, how about the transition idea? We obviously will have, you've got a lot of equipment out there that nobody's going to discard. What does ONF have to say about transition between Existing the existing world and the world of open flow. Well, we certainly understand the investments that our uh, our members have made um, in the equipment that's out there now. We expect this will continue as, as long as they get uh, value from it. Um, what we want to see is uh, an ease of introduction of the new capabilities, and I think it's a lot easier with open flow than it is with others in that. You can put sort of a box in at a time and figure out how to make it work without changing what the existing uh, network does. You have to segment and partition, whether it's by VLAN or something else. There are ways to do that. Um, but I think it's possible, it's more possible with this than with other things I've seen, to incrementally add open flow and SDM capabilities to an existing network. And I think that there's no more realistic approach because we can't <coughs> expect people to throw out all the investment they have in the current networks to make this work. It'll start for certain niche applications or you know, niche users where they want to see, gee, I can try this with, let's see how it goes. There's a need I have here that's particularly pressing. Let's see if I can solve that need with this. And then if that works, I'll grow it. Nico. Yeah, uh, in one of your uh, slides you talked about, and, and I, I missed the point, but you talked about how one of the releases, the merchant silicon companies, still needed to provide some additional functionality and it kind of triggered a question in my head. Do we, do you think there are enough uh, merchant silicon companies supporting this? I mean, I just know of a couple, two or three, and do we need more? And, um, you know, can they keep up with uh, the requirements? You know, I would welcome anyone, anyone that wanted to join. Um, do we have enough uh, that the system builders have some choice and can get something of their own to market. It seems to be the case. Um, and I would never shy away from, from wanting more. I mean, there, there are a number of ways in which we could have um, more diversity among our membership. And I'm talking with various industries about that. Um, but in, in the area of, of merchant silicon, I think we've got a really good start. Uh, and we've also got some terrific, you know, network processor companies involved too. Hi Dan, uh, for this, uh, sorry, optimal model in this type of sense, ITU did this common mining model more than ten years ago. So, do you have any plan to collaborate with ITU? Uh, do we, we don't have a plan to collaborate with ITU. Um, I know we're in discussions with, uh, with IETF about some things. Uh, don't know about ITO. I, I know that the uh, basic telecommunication standards are things that we don't have to change at this point. Um, you know, if a need arises, we can certainly do that. I've had enough interaction with ITUT over time, um, but I don't have any plan in particular. Now, if there's some particular issues that, that you think uh, we should be talking to them about it. I'd be glad to speak with you about them. 
search for Orange. Uh, I'm trying to um, understand the Open Networking Foundation the relationship with the existing kind, kind of SLO. So you were mentioned ITF. One of the questions that we got is about the ITF forces working group. Mm -hmm. Was trying to, block, uh, to go into the web and see what if there have been discussion. Uh, what is your view? I, mean, I know that you mentioned about the ITF. Is the forces or some sort of obliation you got to have, I think, a second point with ITF? Yeah, we're actually talking in, about in, in order to make our, our life to sell the ONET Foundation easy internally because it's becoming a very yeah. straightforward. You know, yeah, I've looked at forces a little bit. I don't, I don't see that as being quite as relevant as some of the new activities they have in what they're calling SDN, Software Driven Networks. Um, and, and what that's about. Um, so, yeah, so we know the people, we know the area directors, so I've, I've talked with, with Tom, and uh, uh, so, you know, we're in good communication with them, and we, you know, neither of us wants to step on each other's toes. There's, there's so much work to do, we can't, you know, unless it's everybody doing the same thing. Okay, good day. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks, again. So while you're both standing there, we may not have the opportunity later in the day. I wanted to personally congratulate both of you on putting together an amazing summit over the, the last two days. And I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking you. This has just been really exciting. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we are going to take a lunch break and uh, start again. We have a session on service providers and uh, after that, uh, the lack of closing panel. So please.